Our laws as it pertain to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Welcome to our clubhouse guests. Uh, welcome also to all of you out there on Twitch, Twitter. Uh, where are we? Are we Rumble also, Susan, YouTube, yes. and Facebook. Uh, and if those of you who raise your hand want to come up and uh, chat with myself and my special guest, you will be streamed out on all those platforms simultaneously. So just know you're consenting to that if you raise your hand. Uh, I am really excited. I want to get right to my guest. This is somebody I have loved for many years. Uh, Dr. Joycelyn Elders, 15th Surgeon General of the United States, first African-American, second female, second woman in charge of the U.S. Public Health Services, uh, advocate for sex education, addiction treatment. At the time, I think she invented fake news and mob action. She was the first victim of somebody twisting into a fake news and then the mob doing their thing before social media. That was uh, she was in 1994 in the Clinton administration, and the controversial views, so-called, that she had back then are strictly speaking mainstream today. She is currently a professor emeritus at the University of Arkansas School of Medical Sciences. She is not to be trifled with, a pediatrician, a biochemist, and a vice admiral. Welcome, Dr. Joycelyn Elders. It's a pleasure to Joycelyn. be here with you, Dr. Yeah. It is a. It is a. Uh, it is such a joy to see you. You have no idea. We, Dr. Elders, and I knew each other. 20 or 25 years ago, no, no, we were no, working no, for a company. No, no. I won't say it. Okay. I, oh. We knew each other. I, I loved, we knew each other. We lo I loved working for Trojan. So. Well, this is what happened. We were working for a, the Trojan and the, the sister company. Really, it was the heels of the AIDS epidemic. And we were trying to get more widespread and, and, and regular use of condoms. Uh, and, you know, both uh, Dr. Elders was there in the, in the in Washington during the AIDS epidemic. I was training and cut my teeth in the early part of my career was working on the AIDS epidemic. And it's interesting to me, Dr. Elders, that you know, the younger physicians today don't have that perspective of a pandemic that we worked with that had a 100% fatality associated with it. And that, I, I don't know about you, but that affected everything else that followed in my career. There's no question, you know, I, you know, we look upon AIDS when you got the diagnosis of AIDS, it was a death sentence. And it was, mm -hmm. and you know, now it's, uh, it's been converted, thankfully, to the progress that's been made to a chronic disease. That does not say that you, you know, it, 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 the net, there is no problems, but it's now a more of a chronic disease as opposed to being a death sentence. So. That's absolutely we right. And we had, I would tell pain. people, yeah, that's right. I, I would, I would sit down the, I was a late in medical school, early in residency. I'd sit somebody down first diagnosis and just tell them they had six months to live. And I was never wrong. It was, it was just ridiculous. A horrible illness, one of the darkest periods. And unfortunately only the caretakers are left now with the memory of it. Cause so many people were lost during that time. But talk, talk to me a little bit about what it was that happened to you, because I think it, I, am I right in framing it as fake news and the first the first victim of the mob that is now commonplace cancel culture. Let's put it that way. Uh -oh. It was fake news and cancel culture. Joycelyn Elders invented it. Well, I'm not sure that's quite true, but there is no question that there was an awful lot of fake news going on. There was a lot of things going on. And I was accused of, you know, I. And people, a lot of people still remember me all over the world as the condom queen, you know, that I was, and well, the reason I was called the condom queen is because I felt so strongly, I wanted so strongly to prevent HIV AIDS. I didn't want our young people getting it. And it, it seems though our young black men was get you know, really like the diseases, diseases we have now, people of color are far more likely to um, you know, have a higher prevalence. And I remember going to a church and the pastor said that 
HIV AIDS only occurred in white gay men. And of course, well, you know, so, so that was obviously very fake, very fake news. The most common cause of death for a very long while for young men between the ages of 15 and 45 was HIV AIDS. And so, mm-hmm. I, so I was, I would tell young girls, you know, we've got to stop this because the only place, only place you can go and find a husband, you've got to go either to the graveyard, you know, uh, or, or to, to jail. That was because of the drug up epidemic. So it was it was really a very trying time. And of course, as I said, so I didn't mind being called a condom queen. <laughs> and, and again, unfairly judged by some for, for, for that moniker that now you could hold up with pride. Um, now, one of the things I'm going to go back and forth a little bit between, you know, back <laughs> then say. and now. Um, w- one of the things that um, that I have been saying since the beginning of the present pandemic is uh, Dr. Fauci has been my leading light through five pandemics and HIV, one yes. of them, H1N1, H1N1, SARS-1, MERS, and now SARS-2. And yes. I keep saying that, uh, first of all, you can rely on his judgment. And secondly, when this all settles, he's going to look, he's going to look pretty good. Because I'm just going to say, just based on my previous experience with him, but you were there with him during the AIDS epidemic, I imagine. Absolutely. Absolutely. We, you know, and we had to fight through lots of things and lots of things were, you know, we were accused of lots of things, lots of things were wrong. And, you know, we had to really, we had to really fight through the gender crisis. The LG, in fact, I always felt that told people that one of the things that helped me out the most when the LGBT group went and stood on the senator's desk and stomped and, and about the problems that was going on. And so, you know, I'd been fighting hard with tobacco, but now I was really out there fighting hard for, with, for HIV and health care. And of course, yeah, I was it's, always it's, about uh, sexuality, teenage sexuality problems. Yeah, the, the the echoes of that pandemic for me still ring true today, and and I I'm sort of it, it find it curious that because of that experience, I feel like the younger physicians today, this pandemic affected them differently. It's it it I don't know I I don't I don't it's it, when the dust settles. Well, I'll have more to say I suppose when I look back on this, but that that whole experience, um, yourself, Dr. Fauci, were such incredible guiding lights during what was an unbelievably dark era. I mean, people have of course seen the, you know, Dallas Buyers Clubs, you know, shows and stuff. Yeah. But you, you don't remember there was a period where we had treatments and there were groups out there undermining the treatments. Much much the way yeah. people are doing right now with the antivirals that are coming. We had right. I was there when the first boxes of AZT were opened at LA County Hospital. And I was like, oh my God, we can do something for these people. But you couldn't get anybody to take it because there was fake news everywhere about how the AZT or whatever antivirals followed were causing H- causing AIDS. There's no question. You know, with each time, you know, we go through these epidemics which turn into pandemics, and then we go through we get drugs, and I was we're all so grateful. At least I am, and I think everybody I know that we've got a vaccine that we can really in some ways head off this pandemic. And it was, I remember, you see, I, I grew up even doctoring through the periods of when we, when polio was causing massive pra- mm. paralysis all across the country. So that was mm-hmm. a real problem. We did at least have a vac- uh, uh, immunization for smallpox. You know, I was a, you know, I was a student, but I remember when we came and we lined up like little ducks and the public health department came in and just went that, down our row. We were lined up against the wall and while they were doing smallpox immunizations. And heaven knows 
everybody. No, I don't. I don't remember any people being upset and not wanting smallpox vaccinations. Of course, you know then you know, and you know now we're hollering about immunizations, but you know, we, you couldn't go to school if you didn't have the immunizations. And now, unless children have their immunizations for you know the childhood immunizations, they can't go to school. And we had another outbreak of measles just the past two or three years, because mm-hmm. there were certain people who would come in and who didn't have, and who did not want their children immunized. So, you know, so we've always had immunizations. We've always, we no, we've always given and mandated immunizations. And mm-hmm. we're all, and I think most scientists that I know were thrilled when we finally get the, the you know, the uh, vaccines and immunizations to head off the pan- epidemics of pandemics. And, you know, whereas, you know, w- w- we were all very hurt and concerned about the HIV epidemic, but at least we developed a drug. But it, it's in, so we've got it converted it to a chronic disease. Mm-hmm. Exactly, or, or an endemic illness of some type that we can manage, which I, I see yes. coming with the antivirals. It just, it just all, right. it all, you know. Again, the the experience with HIV and AIDS was so vivid for me as a physician that, you know, I see how yeah. you know we're going to get this thing. I, I see it. I see how it works, and it, it also informed. I know a lot of people are very critical of Dr. Fauci, but I I have not been because he's got a crazy position he's in, and, oh. and I imagine you can relate to that. I I I, I think. I say thank all the time. Thank God for Dr. Fauci. I think that you know he's had to will stand a lot, stand up and fight against a lot. And heaven knows, I, 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 I'm, I don't feel I had to fight nearly the kinds of fights that he's had to fight over and over again for so long. You know, I, mm-hmm. you know, I remember fighting the fight in in regard to marijuana. I, you know, just, mm. it, it's just. We've just had many fights, but we've got to better educate our people. And I think that's part of the problem. So, we've not yeah, educated well, yeah. people to be healthy. Medical education, you know, basic medical education, I, I, I agree with you on that. Science education, too, is the other thing. So, yes. um, yeah, uh, shoot, I had some, oh, oh, gosh darn it, what was I going to get? My my aging brain. Oh, I know what I get into. Since... Um, <laughs> Don't talk about since, our aging brain. You don't know about well, that. Well, yours is doing. I, I, I do, unfortunately. If, 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 but it seems mine seems to be a uh, well. I mean, ahead of you in terms of uh, its advanced state. But, but uh, as it pertains, when you said the drug epidemic that you were fighting as as Surgeon General, yes. I, I after we were together, I ended up going deep into addiction uh, world and running a big program and getting a lot of board certification yep. expertise. I, I was just starting that stuff when I knew you and I, I became deeply involved in that. And I look back at, I, I, I was, uh, I treated a lot of crack patients. Uh, uh, and, yep. and I, I looked at it at the time as the illness it was. I didn't, I didn't have any, I didn't, I just knew what this disease was. I didn't care what the drug of choice was. I knew how this thing worked. I mean, the, there's a natural history with each drug and there's, psychiatric concomitants with each drug, but I, I didn't care which drug it was. But when you look back now at the way we sort of, I don't know if it's the press or the public, I, I, I don't know what it is, who, who, who sort of made it like this, but the, the opioid epidemic we treated as an illness while we tended to treat at least the, some of the powers that be treated the crack epidemic as a criminal problem. But in fact, nice. it was just the same disease, different, different, biochemistry, different biology, because right. different, different uh, uh, pharmaceutical agent. What was that like for you when, you when you were in the midst of all that? Well, it was it was very difficult uh, for me. You know, I, I for a while, you know, for, you know, even with the, you know, higher level class opioids, well, you know, they treated crack very different. You know, the mm-hmm. amount of crack you needed for to get a arrest or sent to prison for years and was very different from the amount of, uh, you know, pure cocaine. Uh, so I'm just saying that I, I was very, 
I, I, I was very bothered about this. I felt that there were so many young black men whose lives were really being destroyed about by a small amount of uh, what I call like marijuana. And this was the most common cause you know, of, of, of their arrest. This was the cause of most young black men being sent to prison because they couldn't afford many of the other higher, more expensive drugs. So it, and, and reasoning with politicians it, it was, was difficult because as far as they were concerned, they could not, they could not accept the fact that I felt, that, you know, I felt what well, we, we should study. You know, I recommended, yeah. you know, I didn't know what to do about marijuana, but I thought we should study it. Well, you know, I was kind of shot down and said, we aren't going to study it. We aren't going to do research. We aren't going to do anything. Well, of course, we're doing that now. But, you know, but yeah, we the, all the, go those places. Yeah, the, the National Institute of Drug Abuse has uh, gotten into it. Uh, Nora Volkow right. came in right about that time. I think she must have been coming in like, so, so when we were together, she was already in the right. in the uh, position at NIDA. Um, right. And uh, again, an, another person that's a guiding light in, in all this uh, trouble. Well, yeah, but, but so, we just have to fight and do the best best we can about the problems as we as we as, as we see them and so uh and, and of course i was fighting at the at the same time we were talking about the drugs uh mm. then one of our one of our attorney attorney generals I, I, I'll think of his name as I go along. My brain won't call it up now, but he's on a lot, and, and he's done. He's changed a lot, and he's made, made lots of progress. Was he? Was he very? He was criminalizing the the crack thing. Oh that yes, very there? much so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was very yeah. much so. Yeah, that, that I, I'm embarrassed by that. How the medical profession jumped on that. I I, I thank God yeah. I was not. I was treating it as an illness. But I feel like the medical profession did not stand up, did not push back hard enough uh, oh, no. to, to really. Uh, no, yeah, I know. I, I think that's a shame. Uh, and then the opiate thing is a whole other. You know that we've I've talked about it many right. times here on the stream. That, that's something I had to live with. I thank God we're moving on the other, moving towards the other side of that. So, how has COVID been for you? Uh, are you been okay? Has your family been okay? Well, I, luckily, and I'm very thankful. You know, I've had even my booster shot. So I've had my shots shot so far. My all my family is that no one is in my immediate family uh, has uh, had COVID. But my children are you know in the school system, and so they were the two of them had COVID. My son is a principal, and so he had COVID, but but he he he, he had very few symptoms, and he did very fine. And his wife had. COVID and she, and she did, you know, she was sick. I mean, my son wasn't very sick, but they both recovered and they're both doing fine. They've had their boosters and they're both working every day, you know, back at school, working every day and encouraging everybody to get their immunizations. But we still have lots of people, you know, our ignorance is not bliss. We still have many people. Right. Let, let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. How, how how do you persuade people that are resistant? I, I feel that the shaming and all that is just a terrible approach. I mean, think about what we did during HIV. We right. never did anything like that. We never, never. did. Never. How, how? What would yeah. you? Uh, isn't that weird that we're doing that now? And 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 in in a sort it of makes no. It just does. It does the opposite. It, it does the opposite, and and you know, and and I just think I really think that most of the problem that we have is because of lack of knowledge. People just mm -hmm. don't know better. And, you know, if they really knew and understood and appreciate, you know, they wouldn't be involved in all of this fake news. They wouldn't be hearing all of these things that they hear, you know, sometimes on TV and they get, 
you know, if they if they had more education, that they would do a lot better. I yeah, and I always go back to that old those old quotes. This is Benjamin Franklin. I think said, "You can't keep ignorant people healthy." And so you you know, <laughs> I, <and> that's you, <laughs> But, well, it, it's it's interesting, but I I tell you where we I think we got off the and, and you as a public health official I, I'm curious in your thoughts, we we got off badly by using panic and fear and intimidation yeah. and shaming uh, from the beginning. We did that with the right. compliance with public health mandates. We've done it with man, vaccine mandates, and we've been obfuscating. We've been obscure with the data. You know, when you, as you say, educate people, I feel like one of the ways we have to educate them is give them all the data we have on the vaccines. Let them see everything that's out there. Because look, we, we as physicians, we always do stuff that have adverse effects. We Everything. And, everything. and let them see it. Show it all to them. Yeah. Show it to them and, and help them understand how we make these decisions. The whole decision, the two things that have been so absent for me in this pandemic are decision making around risk reward. And the public health messaging that we did so well during HIV and AIDS that seems to have been abandoned during this pandemic. Do you agree? Uh, well, you know, I think that uh, the problem we go through, have gone through, has really been our lack of education and and lack of getting patients as involved. You know, we rather mm. than you know, we've got to get patient more patient centered. You know, we. I think that that's one of the things is medicine is moving away from being primarily yes. doctor. You know, you know, there was a time we didn't want doctor patients to know anything. You know, we wanted to carry it all around ourselves, and more and more we're getting patients involved, let them be involved in decision making. But you know, you can't make decisions if you don't know how. If we've not educated well, I, I, our patients. I, I, and, and, you know, and, and, right. And then, and then given the information they need to make those decisions. Absolutely. I think, and, and we've not always done that. We've not given them all the decisions, all the information they need to make informed decisions about, you know, we'll, we'll say, well, what, what do you want to do about it? How can you decide what to do about it when you don't know what to do? So I'm saying that we have a responsibility too, and that's why I feel so strongly that we really need to have comprehensive health education in our schools from kindergarten mm -hmm. through 12th grade or even up through college. But certainly we've got to have it from the beginning. We've got to teach them how to be healthy, teach them about their bodies, teach them about the importance of good nutrition. <coughs> you know, don't wait until I have a stroke. And then start right. teaching me that I shouldn't eat certain things. Insist that I start early. You know, we took physical education out of schools. That we, uh, when we really need to have our young, our young people early on start with good physical ed, you know, good nutrition and exercise. And of course, we've got to teach them the importance of mental health and good relationships because. You know, if we don't have that and relationships with other people and really our mental health, well, then we wonder why we have so much uh, Alzheimer's. Well, the, the, they're showing the best things we can do for Alzheimer's now is start. We need to start very early with good nutrition, with exercise and, of course, good relationships. Well, I want to let me shine a light on what you're saying here. That that literally the I've talked to a lot of Alzheimer's specialists, and they always say the number one you know people I think out in the world think doing crossword puzzles and learning new things. No, number one thing socializing. Number one, right? Number one. That that's how we use most of our brain is in a social interpersonal context. I I certainly believe that, and I and I and. It, you know, it makes us use our brain. If you know, if we yeah. never really have any social interpersonal relation, you know, we don't have to. We can just sit and stare all day long. 
So if let's go back to COVID for a second. If if you were a historian, a medical historian, doing a sort of a post mortem, it's a little early to do that because we don't, you know, we don't know the. It's hard to you really have to look way past before you can look back on something. Any any suggestions on what to do differently? What should we have done? What what went well? What didn't go so well? If you were Surgeon General now, what are the things you do differently? That kind of those kinds of questions. You tell me. Oh, oh, oh. well. You know, you know, we can all we can always stand back, or sometimes frequently stand back and second guess. I think, obviously, if we had gotten everybody with the vaccine earlier, we certainly would have markedly reduced. We wouldn't have had seven hundred thousand deaths. I don't think we might have, but I don't think so. If we had, uh, I think, if we had known about you know things like wearing masks, you know, we wouldn't even accept wearing. The, Mask, social distancing. Well, yeah, you know, we were fighting about what well, we didn't feel we needed to do that, and of course, I, you know, isolations, and that we needed to make sure that, that we got the vaccinations out to everybody, and that we were all involved. It, and so, I, I'm just saying, and you, you know, we start, and we start again with blaming, blaming the poor, blaming the people of color. Blaming, you know, in, in small. How can you? How can you social? How can you isolate somebody if you live in a? They're eight or nine. If you living in a three room house, so I'm just saying that there are just things that I think that we we could have done. We could have done some things better. We were not prepared. You know, we didn't. Even, well, that's true. I mean, that we, that is one. There, yeah, that's sort of you know you know that's we don't we don't often think about that as a criticism of what happened but that is why things happened the way they did because we were not prepared that's a great point yeah and, and then for me you mentioned isolation which i thought we managed the the traditional tools of infectious disease really poorly uh, isolation and testing should have been much better done we, we yes. could have done that so I much done better. i mean that's what we always do i, I the, to me the confusing thing was why we abandoned the things we know how to do well, we, we know how to persuade. Yeah, we know how to isolate. We know how to, to to test. We know how to make risk rewards for a given patient analysis. You know, we know how to enhance mental health while making a decision on behalf of the medical condition. And we know how to do this testing. And we know how to. And what we did do well, you know, of course, we knew how to you know respond from a biotechnology standpoint and create a vaccine, which was extraordinary, right? I, I knew we would. I just knew we'd come up with stuff. I, I'm a little mystified why it's taking so long to get the antivirals to market because those are looking really good. And that's the final sort of technological instrument we need for this thing. You know, we our scientists have worked hard, developed a lot of good drugs. And the fact that we developed a vaccine so quickly, you know, we, there were complaints that, well, we developed it too quickly. Well, you know, I think there was mm -hmm. a big, big push on our part of government and on the part of scientists and, and, and drug companies to really get a vaccine and to get it to market. What if it had been 10 years? Like, what if they had taken as long for that as it took for, let's say, even smallpox? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it would have been 100 years. <laughs> That's like, yeah. And smallpox well, was a, a rapid medical advance. I mean, let's just talk about syphilis. Right. That was around for well, 400 right. years before you yeah. figured that one out. Yeah, I, I, that that's why, you know, when I remember back in the AIDS days, when people would go, oh, I can't believe there's been no attention to this and it took so long to come up with treatments. There was never been anything like that in the history of medicine. How fast they've come up with a new causative agent, isolated the illness, came up with treatments. It's just right. uncanny in the history of medicine. Uh, only to be rivaled by this one, really. So this one was pretty quick, too. Um, how did you get involved in government? I, I don't know that history. Well, how did I get involved? I didn't plan in any way to get involved in government. You know, I was a pediatric endocrinologist on, on the faculty doing bench research at the university. So that's that's where I started. But then I was asked by Bill Clinton, then the governor of Arkansas, to be the director of health for, for, for Arkansas. Well, I, you know, I wasn't I wasn't really trained in public health. I didn't quite know public health. And, you know, but I, I felt, well, 
you know, and I told somebody, I said, and I did, certainly didn't know politics. I was not involved in that. I said, but you know, I said, if I've been training bright young medical students for 20 years, I said, I know I can learn to talk yeah. with these old politicians and learn. And so, so, so it was a matter of learning. But then, you know, when, when he asked, asked me to be the director of health, I want you to know that I uh, thought that it was, it, uh, that, you know, why would I give up a professorship at the university with the research program going on and, and fellows working in my lab to go be the health director? Well, my right. mother called me. She knew Bill Clinton. And so she <laughs> so she she told she says, Oh, you need to just go you just got to go over and help him. Well, I want you to know that uh I I, I went over to be I didn't really plan to go to stay. So I just said I told him, I said, Well, I'll say I'll take it as a trial. I said, Well, I'll if you I keep my appointed position. I'm the, as, as, as a health director, uh, you allow, um, allow me to run the health department, and and and, and then and, and I get a ten percent. I get an increase in salary. I didn't get the increase in salary, but I did. He he said he said all oh, all right. Oh, the other thing I, I I tell people I was so smart back then. I didn't realize I was being smart. I, I said, I want to keep my appointment as a professor that I have at the university. I was a tenured professor. I said, I want to keep my tenured mm. professor at the health at, at the university. And I said, and then I want to be, if anything happens, I want to be assured that I can come back to my job. He went to the, he went to the uh, board. Of, of the University of Arkansas, and he called me up. You know, I told him that that was the only way I would take the job. Me, he said, "Well, I got it all done. Will you take it?" <laughs> I that, that was when I was going. To, I, I I said, "I said, oh, I said I don't want to lie." He said, "Thank you, bye." <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! So, and, and so the next morning we didn't talk about it. So the next morning it was in the paper that I was the health director. Wow. Hey, so, I get the feeling sometimes that we would be, be better off with some straight up clinicians um, and medical educators sprinkled through the leadership of public health without all these public health experts. I, I don't, I'm not sure that, I don't know. I, I, I feel like they, unless they spent years or decades in the clinics, they don't quite have the right perspective. Am I? And so my question to you, A, am I right? And B, was it was it something you could learn on the job? Well, I think I think both. If you want to learn, but see, when I went to the health department, I inherited twenty six hundred bright young people who weren't set in their ways and who was wanting to make me succeed. I wanted to make the health department succeed and do well. And then they had. Uh, they felt that they had a health director. That I'll never forget. The deputy the director said, "Told all that he really had. A, he had control for the most part over the health department." He said, "He said we've got a health director that walks on the edge, and we have to make sure she's always razor sharp." And I want you to know, I felt that th that was the most delightful, wonderful six years of experience working I ever had in my life, because every time I would be testifying in, at, at the legislature or something, and they could tell when I was stumbling and didn't know what I was talking about, I would feel a piece of paper coming up under my arm. And, and, and they had taught me, well, say, Dr. Ellison, you don't know, just say, uh, sir, I'll get back, back, back with you tomorrow. I'll look it up and I'll get it back with you tomorrow. I'll uh, circle back. Soon. I'll circ back to you. That's right. <laughs> I've That's heard that right. before. I learned to do that uh, well. Uh, and it's uh, really funny. Uh, and, and what would what would be the
the the measure of success as the health director? Was it just the metrics improving in a positive direction? Is that what you're looking for, a trend? Well, I, I think there's no question. The metric improved in a very positive direction. The people that worked there, you know, I think they just suddenly became very proud that they worked that the health department made a difference in their communities. And then, you know, we had a health, we had a centralized health department. So all in all of our small communities, even the legislators who was there, they was always the people who they worked for the central, but they would go back and make sure their legislators knew what was going on. And you know, and if and then they would call, now you've got to have our new health director down, you know. Oh, out in the Delta. Down. So I was going going out all the time. And they were out there making sure that I was always welcoming and I knew what was going on. And I remember one time, if you can imagine, I was testifying about abortion, a teenage pregnancy. And mm-hmm. there was, we had invited a you know, speaker to come in and he kept talking. And then these were legislators who weren't necessarily, they, they didn't, weren't necessarily wild about me. And uh, 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 the, the, and so this legislator finally got up and he said, he said, sir, he said, I, li- I live in that community. I left that community and just this morning. He said, I know what you're saying is not correct. And I really know that what our health director just said is what the facts are. He said, now, and so he, and he, so he started again. He started again. He said, sir. He said, are, he said, are you finished? And he started, he, he started just, you know, reading the same thing. He said, he said, hey, thank you. And this was a very high paid consultant that they, that the other side had had to come in. But, you know, he w- it was putting out a lot of false facts, but this was because the people, it wasn't because of me. It was because of the people who lived in that community, who worked in that community community who made a difference and kept their legislators informed that really was the thing that really made a the real difference. My daughter Paulina is a big fan of yours. She, she and I wrote a book we've been out uh, on the campaign trail with right now. It doesn't have to be awkward. Get it now. And uh, I've invited her up to the podium. I read it yet, but I want you to know that I'm looking forward to get, getting it read, reading and also Thank your daughter. Uh, well, she's going to come on the line right now. Paulina, you there? Hello, Dr. Elders. Hello. I'm so proud of you and what you've done. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm I'm just waiting to get it. I was, I was trying to get it before I came on today so I could be informed, but I, I'm not informed yet. Oh. But I know it'll inform me. Thank you so me. much, buddy. Not- that is such an honor. I, I heard your episode of 70 over 70 and I was so moved by your interview and I begged my dad. I was like, do you know who Dr. Elders is? <laughs> and he was like, oh, yeah, I know her. And I was like, you know her? <laughs> and my cred, just, you know, my cred just went up, Joycelyn. Thank you for that. So I, I was elevated in her eyes. Yeah, I don't get starstruck for anybody else. Here's Here it is. So, yeah, I um, I would love for you to retell the story about the little girl and um, her purse, if you'd be willing to, because I just think it's a really oh. funny story. Oh. And I think it's a testament to the work that you were doing back in the 90s. Well, okay, well, I I was, you know, you know I'd always gone around and talk, talked a lot. And then the, this little girl, she was, it, she was in... Uh, elementary school or even earlier. She was about eight years old or less. And and they were having their a, a program or a poem or dance or something. And so she said, uh, she was going and her mother, her grandmother, who's a minister, uh, was uh, getting her ready. And so she had went out, you know, she, they really went out, but gotten involved. She went out and she said she wanted to go. There was to go who who they wanted to be that day. And so she went out and got the material and everything and made her a Surgeon General's uniform. And so she was going to go as a as Dr. Elders. And so Hmm. she she got she got she so she all dressed up and she was ready to go and get ready. 
And so her granddad uh, came into the kitchen. It was, she said it was pouring down rain. And, and again, I told you that the grandmother was a minister, but he came in. And so when he came in and getting ready, she says, oh, oh, granddaddy, I need a condom. And, you know, I mean, he said, his mouth dropped. Threw open, he, yeah. She, 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 she's eight years old. That, she, the mother was a grandmother was a minister of a very large church, and so she said, she, 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 you know, she kind of put her hands on her hips and looked at him, and 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 in a very strange kind of way, he said, "Well, Daddy, I'm a uh, granddaddy or whatever." I'm going to I'm going to be Dr. Elders, and Dr. Elders said you should never go out with somebody you like without a condom in your purse. <laughs> and so she needed a condom <laughs> for her purse. <laughs> so, did, did he get her one, or we just got to shelve no, that for a said, minute? <laughs> no, no, she said. She said he he stood there. He he, he said he, he looked at his wife and he says, "Honey, give me the keys." And he, he took off in the rain to go get her the condoms for her. So she'd have a condom. Fantastic. In Fantastic. Wow. I love that story. And so she Thank went you for Dr. It. Elder. Oh, she, and so, and, and it was shown around and, and on, it was a special day for school children who went and, 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 and she, she, and I think she, she, she may have gotten a prize or something for her dress and a purse and, and on her purse, she was labeled that she was Dr. Elders. That's fantastic. Oh. Which I wonder what she's doing now. Do you have any follow up with her or anything? Did you ever hear? Uh, I, well, you know, I see her grandmother about every week or two at the beauty parlor. And, and I, I haven't, uh, <laughs> and, and, and she was the one who bought me the pictures and gave the permission for them to be used. And I was just, we, we, we and she, She's doing well. Fantastic. Well, anything else? I, you know, I'm just deeply curious about just, you know, how it must have felt to be asked to step down from a position in which you were very suited for. And we, we as a nation needed you. And I, you know, I just, I'm, I'm heartbroken over the fact that we as a nation didn't get your full tenor. And I wonder what it would have been like had you had not stepped down. So the question is, what did it feel like to step down? And were you, you know, relieved, relieved to a certain extent, or was it a more challenging experience? And, and Pauline, I'm going to put you in back to the audience while she answers that. We have to take okay. a break in a minute. So here we go. Well, okay. well you, you go know, uh, it, it, you know, it's painful to be a, it's always painful to be a, asked to step down, even if you wanted to be, you know, wanted to step down, but I um, really, I felt I was right. I felt I, was, I felt that I knew why I came to Washington. You know, I knew what I came to fighting for young people. That was my, to me was my big fight, or if you will. You know, I was fighting about, I wanted every child born in America to be a planned and wanted child. You know, I wanted all young people to get the best education that they could. You know, my always, my mother had always said, "Don't, uh, you know, if you want to get out of the cotton patch." You know, we were born. I was born in rural Arkansas, very poor. So you got to get something in your head. So we bought. There was always a big push about education. She always said, "You, you've got to tell the truth." So the day you see the truth and cease to speak out is the day you begin to die. And, and you know, and mm -hmm. this was just kind of a philosophy that went on in our family. All of my sisters and brothers felt the same, I think, felt the same way. And I think, if you know, if you'd ask them, they'd all say, the stress education, stress the truth, and always do your best. That's good enough. She said, may not be as well as somebody else could do it. But if it's the best that you can do, that's good enough. Of course, I, my children, you know, sometimes, you know, they'll say, my children say, oh, mom, I'm doing the best I can, you know, and that that's not always 
best they can. You have to know they're doing the best. I feel that they're doing the best it, they it, can. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I think those are lovely poetic words, frankly. And, and let me just put a coda on them with a joke that uh, my friend Adam Kroll always tells people, which is that if, um, if he doesn't sense they're doing their best, he goes, look, don't do your best. Do my best. Do my best. <laughs> Forget your best. Let's do my best. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that, that, that's so, almost the kind of thing that my husband didn't say, but you know, but he, then he start paying, uh, you know, he start paying them. Uh, a certain smart, amount. smart. So much for A's, B's, C's, and mm -hmm. D's. And all. Super smart. And, people, uh, people are uncomfortable with that. That works. I'm telling you something that, that it's so well, all well, the behavioral so, studies show clearly it works. You 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 pay well, people not to do drugs. You pay people to do the right thing. You pay people to do good great. It works not always, but it does work. Sometimes. So true. It's Listen, uh, with my children, Joyce, and we're going to take a we're going to take a little break here. So I'm going to ask you to sit tight for about three minutes. Okay. Uh, we have to okay. do some business here, and then we'll be back okay. with Dr. Joyce and Elders. Thank you all. You. Very uh, patiently on Clubhouse. I see you there. Raise your hand if you want to come up. Uh, reminder that you will, if you ask a question, you'll be streaming out on YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, and Rumble all at the same time. And of course, in Clubhouse. Uh, and I'm seeing people also on Restream. I'm watching the Restream, so I see you there. Um, let me just clarify a couple of things before I go to break. Well, I'll clarify when I get back. We'll be right back. I want to give a shout out to our good friends at Blue Mics. If you've heard my voice on this show any time over the past year, including right now, you've been listening to Blue Microphones. And let me tell you, after more than 30 years in broadcasting, I don't think I have ever sounded better. But you don't need to be a pro or have a fancy studio to benefit from a quality mic. You may not realize it, but if you've been working from home or using Zoom to chat with friends, you probably spend a lot of time in front of a microphone. So why not sound your best? Whether you're doing video conferencing, podcasting, recording music, or hosting a talk show, Blue has you covered. From the USB series that plugs right into your computer to XLR professional mics like the mouse or the Blueberry we use in the studio right now. Bottom line, there's a Blue microphone to fit your budget and need. I can't say enough about Blue mics. And once you try one, you will never go back. Trust me. To take your audio to the next level, go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Anyone who's watched me over the years knows that I'm obsessed with Hydrolyte. In my opinion, the best oral rehydration product on the market. I literally use it every day. My family uses it. When I had COVID, I'm telling you, Hydrolyte contributed to my recovery, kept me hydrated. Now, with things finally reopening back around the country, the potential exposure to the common cold is always around. And like always, Hydrolyte has got your back. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, my new favorite, starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients Plus, each single serving easy pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, 300 milligrams of elderberry extract. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy to pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water, make a great tasting drink, has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink, uses all natural flavors, gluten free, dairy free, caffeine free, non GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready to drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy. Or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H Y D R A L Y T E dot com slash D R D R E W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. Here with my daughter, Paulina, to share an exciting new project. Over the years, we've talked to a ton of young people about what they really want to know about relationships. It's difficult to know who you are and what you want, especially mm. as a teenager. And not everyone has access to an expert in their house like I did. Of course, it wasn't like I was always that receptive to that advice. Right. No kidding. But now we have written the book on consent. It is called It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward, and it explores relationships, romantic relationships, and sex. It's a great guide for teens, parents, and educators to go beyond the talk and have honest and meaningful conversations. It Doesn't Have to Be Awkward will be on sale September 21st. You can order your book anywhere books are sold. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, and of course, your independent local bookstore. Links are available on drdrew.com. So pre-ordering the book will help people, well, raise awareness, obviously, and it'll get that conversation going early so more people can can notice this and spread the word of positivity about healthy relationships. So if you can, we would love your support by pre-ordering now. Totally. And as we said before, this is a book that both teenagers and their parents should read. 
Read the book, have the conversation. It doesn't have to be awkward. On sale September 21st. You can get the book at premiercollectibles.com. You get signed copies there. Also at Dr. Drew, uh, Premier Collectibles slash awkward. You can get the book there. Also drdrew.com slash awkward. Uh, we are going to bring in Dr. Elders in just a second again. She, of course, is the 15th Surgeon General of the United States and was embroiled in a lot of controversial stuff unnecessarily back in the days. But even before social media, it was possible for the press to create crap storms for people. Speaking of crap storms, I've been watching you guys on uh, Restream here, and I want to address a couple things really quickly. Somebody asked the issue of uh, 27 times the natural, that natural immunity has 27 times more efficacy than vaccinated immunity. That is not... It's not the way biology works. I, I, I would just be careful of, of those kinds of quantitative. Well, I'll ask Dr. Elders the same question if she agrees with me on this. It appears that natural immunity, immunity is broader and more sustained than most of the vaccines alone without boosters. How long and for whom is still an open question. We still don't know how to standardize immunity. We don't know how to make measurements of immunity just yet. I have some ideas because I've been working with addicts for a while. I have some ideas about what that would look like. We have not yet standardized it. One day, you'll be able to take a test that says, aha, you're still immune, you don't need a booster, or you've had natural immunity, you're good, you're neutralizing antibodies or whatever. The other thing that was flying around was my opinion on Dr. Fauci. As I've said repeatedly, um, he's this. people are, they find him very controversial right now. I'm just telling you, I've been through five pandemics with this guy. He has been my guiding light on four of the five. And I suspect when this, just because he was so good in those four, my experience, particularly during HIV, my bet is that you'll feel differently about him looking back once this thing all settles. That's I may be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, but he has been a leading light for me. He's the reason I got involved in radio. He was telling us back in the day to get out there and educate about HIV and AIDS, and I took it to heart. So it was really because of him. And then finally, uh, people seem to be confused about my vaccine position, which is, you know, I'm pro-vaccine. I couldn't wait to get the vaccine. I was in a hurry to get it. I got sick first. Um, all my family's been vaccinated fully, and but but I, however, I am I am concerned about mandates. I, I worry that forcing people to do things where the risk reward is not that clear. I much prefer always patient and physician making those decisions individually. I understand we have to do something collectively to get this virus replication down so that no new variants develop. But I, I'm concerned about that, and I do believe the whole landscape will change once we have the new antivirals available. That's what this whole landscape's gonna shift a little bit. So I'm looking forward to that. So those are my opinions. Dr. Elders, welcome back. I'm bringing jo Joseph Elders in here. Uh, we, she and I, again, uh, were working on, for the Trojan folks back in the day to try to get people to use condoms more regularly. And we both felt very passionately about that and had a really interesting think tank where we tried to help help do that. I think we did some good, in fact. And uh, if no other good came of it, then I got to know Dr. Elders. That was well worth the experience. It was, I, I, th I thought the Tayshat was a wonderful uh, organization. And I thought we worked very hard, had very good people. And I thought we made some good decisions. Mm -hmm. And I think we helped the company. So it was, I, I think, all, and I think we helped people. And, you know, and I thought you you were most helpful in creating what I called our, you know, our, our, our condom Bible. Yeah. And so. All, right. You know, the, I remember all, that. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Wow. That's right. That was your idea. That was a great little, uh, little document. And, and oh I gosh. was saying, you know, you know, one of the things that I, that I find that I thought was really one of the most useful things. And I've told condom that I really, uh, uh, Tayshak, a Trojan that they should do this is you know they have made uh you know, the you know cotex put out a little you know they didn't we don't we didn't have sex education didn't have books like you and your daughter have just put out written so you know we really had very little education especially we didn't have health education in school so we had very little of that going on yeah. but no, no, and we were we were trying to we were go, go ahead cotex what i'm sorry Oh, well, I was just going to say, Kotex had a little pamphlet that was, you know, it was more than a pamphlet. It was a book. It was really for, mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was the sex education. It was the only sex education that we in the country got is what, we, what they had in that little 
pamphlet that came out and I, I still feel very strongly about it. Uh, but I said for their for the boys, all boys for their uh, 12th to 14th birthday, I feel that they should make a little pamphlet, pamphlet and for their 14th birthday, mail them a, a sample of the condoms and you, you know you know their the, the the condom bible and just so they would yep. know that there are different sizes different colors different tastes all of those things and you know they have it it wouldn't cost them very much but you know the reason and, and they said well they really would but parents wouldn't accept it well i i know how yeah, difficult and, that is well and you were important guiding light with us trying to figure out how to make it digestible for people so they wouldn't react so you know this was a different time man condoms had just come out from behind the counter you used to have to have the pharmacist go get the condoms and and, and we were we were we, we weren't we were a think tank that was trying to help establish the use of condoms in a more regular way to save lives i mean really it was like an emergency right. we were people dying right. and uh i think we did a pretty good job i think we did a pretty good job yeah um let me uh, I'm going to get some questions off Clubhouse, if you don't mind. I know some of our restreamers. I've seen, Go Kristen, I'm going to put you up here first because I I saw your uh, concern there. Hold on a second. Joshua, I didn't mean to put, plug you. I'm trying to get. Hi, Dr. Drew. Joshua, I've got to put you back because I need Kristen in here. You're going to be up after that. Okay. Uh, Kristen, you've been asked to come up. Or Joshua, you just want to Joshua. hold for a second. Gosh, I can't get. Oh, my God. This thing doesn't work the way it's supposed to sometimes. I'll he can right save back. a life, but he can't right. work a phone. All right. All right, Kristen, <laughs> there you are. Okay. Hello, Dr. Elder. This is uh, truly Hello. an honor. Thank How you are so you? much for... I, I am very well. Thank you. I have a question that is geared towards uh, mental health support within our public schools for elementary and other students. Uh, right now, the way that No Child Left Behind and IDEA law, and especially laws concerning uh, the needs of special uh, kids that fall into the special education arena, there especially. are a lot of gray areas, it's especially in regards to uh, mental health that can occur within the public school. Right now, at least in my experience, um, it is not offered as a service. It is offered almost as a add-on where insurance and everything is still billed. And I guess my question is, when you were enacting, when you were acting the Surgeon General, did you encounter a particular set of challenges in regards to special education, special education law, and what would you like to see in regards to changing of our currently current policies to allow for more transparency and communication between physicians who treat the children and educators? Yeah, I go. think you've asked. I'm going to put you back in the room, Kristen. So thank you for that. I know you're, worried. I know you're dealing you. with this personally. So go ahead, uh, Jocelyn. Uh, uh, Christian, I think you've asked a very important question. And I think that, you know, we've come a very long way in, ha in taking care of children with special needs and with their, in, in their special education, such that we're designing curriculum and designing programs that are up and right for them and making sure that relationships. And we've also making sure that we involve not you know not only their sexuality because before you know we didn't we couldn't talk about it we couldn't even you know that was just taboo and so we're we've taken our blinders off and we've developed we're developing 2020 vision so hopefully we can see what we need to do and do what we need to do to make a difference and i think doctors are learning that they could really do more and you know and, and not make all everything so doctor centered but make it patient centered uh education mm. not only in regard to uh their sexuality their relationships their education and get parents involved 
And so I, 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 I'm pleased that we're doing as much as we have are doing, and I'm glad we're developing a real core curriculum that fit the children. And so I'm, I'm very proud of that. Dr. Elders, what was your research when you were a bench researcher? But I was a bench researcher. I was really looking at factors that control growth in children. You know, we were had a lot mm. of problems with growth retardation. The most common cause at the time was things if you if it was malnutrition. You know, being in Arkansas, being in the mm -hmm. deep south, mm -hmm. but then things like mm -hmm. hypothyroidism. You talk about the most common cause of mental retardation. That was before we had the, you know, the TSH test where we can really test and know when children are born that they're hypothyroid. Mm -hmm. We know that most of brain growth occurs very early. So, you know, so they really lost a lot sometimes before we even diagnosed that they had a problem. So, so know, let me let me explain to people what Dr. Elder is talking about. She she was doing research and practicing a time before we could detect on a blood to test hypothyroidism. And if you developed, if you were born with a in suboptimally active thyroid, you developed something called cretinism. You developed, you became a cretin, which is a severe brain disorder from from hypothyroidism. Am I getting that right? It's a little medical history I, there, but I, I think that's right. Is that's absolutely correct. And you, you and the most important, you had severe mental retardation and you had severe growth retardation. And I'll spun you that severe constipation, you know. So, uh, so that, so it was a real, it was a real severe problem. So, so i um, so I, I, I really am pleased that we we're able to diagnose it early. And this is no longer a real crisis in our community. And no, and I mean, the people, that they, they, we, they don't, I'm so glad you bring that perspective because I, the current, the modern world doesn't understand the, the right. amount of medical progress we made during the 20th century, how proud, how astonishing it all was. And you were there, you were, you had a, you had a courtside seat. I saw two children with cretinism. You know, I saw this going on. So I'm, I'm very pleased that, uh, that we've made that we can do, you know, diagnoses of, uh, of, of, you know, adrenal hormone, all kinds of hormone deficiencies, mm. so and other kinds of deficiencies and things like metabolic disorders. You know, now that we can diagnose them on screening tests, there are probably twenty four, twenty five, or more tests we can pick up on newborn screening and that's that we just didn't have any idea before we had to wait until they got in trouble and then we would recognize that it was a problem so i, I want to ask you if you agree with me what i said there's a there's a little bit of data flying around in the press that natural immunity immunity is 27 times more eff efficacious than vaccinated immunity. I, I don't like that. That's, that's a construct that I don't think people know how to apply that kind of quantitation. So you as a bench researcher, help us help people understand you, you talk about research. Pe people are, I mean, talk about education. People don't really understand biology that well. I, I say that a <laughs> lot because biology is a, is a probability equation. It's a giant probabilistic phenomenology but go ahead i'll let you answer that about this uh, immunity question well when we talk about immunity if you have a disease you know we have a certain amount of immunity you know if you have a severe disease you may have a you know a higher level of immunity but i don't you know i don't i think having the disease conveys the same kind of immunity uh, but in but that immunization shots Give people give you the vaccine, you develop immunity. We don't know how to measure you've got, you know, 25% or 50% or right. whatever. And exactly. we don't know we, what we haven't standardize it. Right. We don't know what percent yeah. you even need to prevent disease. But we, That's you know, right. we I think That's right. earn that a certain amount will reduce the severity of the disease we know that may I, reduce I, I have a hunch i have a hunch that a certain level of neutralizing antibodies will be the number once we get to the yeah. point that we understand this josh i brought you back up here to ask dr elders a question go ahead yeah uh thanks for taking my call um 
Well, I have a lot to say, but I would just want to start by what you guys had said and also the book that you wrote with your daughter about, I guess, effective communication. And um, I want to know how we can communicate better. I want to know how we can listen to each other, attune to each other, have empathy for each other. Um, I noticed that France just authorized payments for therapy for all of its citizens. And I think they're going in that direction. I think we need to go in that direction too. And therapy seems to be the obvious route to that. But I'm wondering if there's anything we can do now for people who don't have access to therapy, how we can sort of get together more and talk to each other more. If, if social media can help, I mean, we're on Clubhouse, I'm on Clubhouse, this is great. And it's just, I, I just wanted to know the comments on sort of relationship. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask Dr. Ellis, I have my own sort of idea about this. What do you say? What, what sort, what's sort of your instinct on this? Because I have a specific well, one. And, and that's, you know, you're, you, you're the scientist on this and, I, and I'm doing more on instinct. But I think that we need okay. to, uh, relationships are very critical. I think we don't really listen. You know, sometimes when other people are talking, we're waiting for them to shut up so we can get started. And we don't really listen to what they've got to say. And I think that we, and, and we have to learn to listen and, and know what there's, and, and what they're talking, understand what they mean. You know, some people don't always say exactly what they, they really mean or what they're saying is not what they were really thinking. And so I think we have to be able to interpret that. And we have to learn to listen to our children you know, the old folks say, see, I'm an old folk now, but daddy, but children are to be seen and not heard. But I think we need to listen to our children because I think Phil, that they really have a lot to say to us and a lot to teach us. And we need to, uh, we need to listen. We could, I think we could really learn lots of things. I think our children, I, I think our children need to listen too. I'm not suggesting that they not listen. But I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I feel, really feel that we as parents could do a better job sometimes of really listening. Well, sometimes there are some important truths. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say not social media, not anything special. Back to basics, re bodies in space, relating time spent with people who actually care about one another in, in proximity, near each other. I, I, if you want to use scripture, Everything that is a thousands of years old tells you the same thing. It tells you the same stuff. And Dr. Elders is telling you the same thing. We're all saying the same stuff. Family is important. Education is important. Spending time with people that care, you care about each other in person, time invested, caring, listening, being present. You, you will eventually, your body naturally develops the capacity for, for uh, attunement. That, that's how we're wired up that way. It's just we don't spend enough time doing it. And all these uh, things that get in our way are doing just that. They're getting in our way. They're not. They're not solutions. They are the problem right now. And keep it really simple. I would say. Our body language say it again. talks. Sometimes. I say our yeah. body language talks. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's yeah. Oh word. yes. Oh, there. There is so much information going back and forth between two bodies in space. We have not even scratch the surface on how much stuff goes back between our autonomic nervous systems and our you know central part of our brains and all this stuff that we're not consciously receiving we're getting a ton we opened this conversation talking about alzheimer's and how socialization is so important for alzheimer's yes. because we use our whole brain and our whole body in order to socialize we're not aware of it we think we're using language that's a tiny little that's a silly little piece of what's really going on there so yeah, I think that's a, a really important important point, and it's all it's been, you know, as they say, it's been written a thousand times before. Uh, it's it's not as though people from previous generations and previous civilizations didn't know what they were talking about. They knew exactly what they were talking about, and we just and we just keep thinking we get we we magically know something different and better. We don't. We just do it in a different context. We just do. Uh, all right, I'm going to uh, get you another question here. This is from. Uh, Eve, let's see if Eve wants to come up. Uh, Eve, how are you? Dr. Drew. Is Eve right? Wonderful. Eve is correct? Yes, okay. sir. There you are. Always nice to see you. You as well. And I'm always uh, coming on trying to ask questions, you know, relating to uh, mental uh, illness and things right now. Okay. Uh, due to what I've been dealing with with my 
with my uh, daughter. Mm. Um, so as, as I've stayed, uh, you know, closer with her, some of the things I thought might go away, of course, have not. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, there's no drugs involved, anything like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and now it's just getting through day to day with her. Mm -hmm. I realize there's a story going on in her head and I'm wondering how you deal with some of the, you know, there's a story that's going on in her head about what's happening to her uh, versus the reality. For instance, she needed all the lights unplugged or, um, you know, there's strange things going on because the red light is a bad light or things like this. Do, do we know uh, what her diagnosis is? I'm sorry, I forget. We still have, uh, well, the diagnosis that I had, you know, she suffers from uh, some personality disorder, mm -hmm. bipolar. Bipolar, okay. Okay, so, and, see, and, and the question, mm -hmm. you can kind of frame it as a, a specific question. The question is, how do you break through her delusions? How do you find a comfortable space of communication mm -hmm. with it, right? Without, uh, because it's the kind of stuff that it it bl it, it always blows up, All right. right? Yeah. So it, so I I'm going to put you back in the eyes even and just sort of say simply, it's very complicated. But Joyce, what I would say is there's two things. I mean, she needs proper care. She has a brain disorder, and the care has to be rendered. And the fact in California, it is exceedingly difficult to get resistive patients care, and that that is to the patient's detriment, to society's detriment, to the parent's detriment, everybody suffers. So that's a problem. So hopefully you can get her care. If she indeed has a personality disorder, <laughs> dialectical behavioral therapy can be very helpful, number one. Number two, if she's bipolar, medication is essential. It's just a requisite and, and it's highly available now and it's very good mood stabilizers. These things work like crazy. And then the bigger thing though is for you. You need somebody in your corner. You have to, you can't think, I think of mental illness. Uh, Joyce, you remember the little shop of horrors, the plant that ate people, the musical, remember that musical? Yeah, well, addiction particularly and many mental illnesses function just like that plant. If you go in the, if you into the room with the plant, the plant's gonna eat you. And that's just, that was in that movie and in that musical. And it's mental illness, many mental illnesses are that way. You have to have somebody pulling you back, somebody you can either pull you out of these, these uh, spins that you can get into and helping sort of sound, be a sounding board for you. You can sort of figure out what reality is because you get your, your, your our, our tight relationships, we get in with them. We go, we go down the, the rabbit hole with them. And you have to be able to stand back and have to hear somebody else go, no, 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 that's a delusion, man. Just don't, don't reinforce that. Just be firm, be fine. You'll be all right. Those kinds of things. And so you must have your own uh, corner. I, like a fighter has a corner to return to, you must have your own. Joycelyn, anything else you want to add to that? No. I, yeah, I think that you, you, you've covered it, you know, and, and we don't have any slick answers. I just, no, I, no think, that, yeah. that, I think that is a, yes, that, that is, that is the important point. It, it is, there's no magic. There's no snapping of our fingers. There's nothing, you know, just the, the simple that it, it is a, it is as you're this finding, it is an ongoing process. It is a struggle, right. but the reality is the one thing I want to keep in your mind is that treatment works. Treat, mental health treatment really does work. And if you right. can get her to engage in that treatment, which is the, really the, the, that's the grail of the Holy grail of addiction of, of a, any mental health treatment, getting the patient right. to participate. That's the hard right. part. The treatment itself works when the patient participates, but getting them to participate, participate sometime can be really, really rough. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Um, the other, oh, the other topic I wanted to get into with you, and you've sort of brushed past it a couple of times, which is uh, inequities in our healthcare system uh, and stuff you've struggled with. Obviously, we've, talk, we've talked about it a couple of times already in this little interview. What, what do you What do you hope for looking forward? You know, I wish I knew. You know, we've been wor working with the problem problems related to racism in medicine, disparities in medicine, you know, all the inequities that's, uh, that, that's going on, on. And we've learned a lot. I think COVID has taught us a lot. It's exposed an awful lot of our uh, 
uh, it, it's un, give up, taking our blinders off such that we no longer have, such, such we now have 2020 vision when coming to looking at some of these things that's been going on forever. You know, we felt that we didn't know them and didn't know that, that they existed. But I just think that as we know more, as we learn more, we're going to do better. And, you know, every year I tell people all the time, you know, we've been talking about we are going to correct all of our disparities in healthcare. When we started, first started out in, I don't know when we started out in 1990 or 1980, looking, and that was one of our goals. We're still there. It's still our second or third goal, and we've not gotten there yet. We still have all of those disparities. They still exist. And I think COVID-19 made us open our eyes, get 2020 vision and take a fresh look. And I think we should hope we should use this opportunity to look, open our eyes as clearly as we can and begin to really address some of these problems and talk about them. See, the problem is we just didn't talk, some of them we just didn't talk about is we talk about like sex health education. We didn't talk about it. We didn't teach our doctors. We didn't teach our parents. We didn't teach anybody. We just kind of zoomed over it. And, 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 and yet we expected our parents to be able to teach our children. How can parents teach their children anything about sexuality education when they don't know how? Well, then the same is true when we talk about, we didn't talk about gender. We didn't talk about uh, race. We didn't, you know, we, did, we didn't talk about a lot of those other isms that we carry around on our back. Hopefully, with, the, uh, with all of the, we've had to stop and think about it, talk about it, and look at it, that we can begin to address some of those issues and begin to talk about them think about them and be made more aware of them. And I think as we become increasingly aware, better educated, and as we know more, and as we learn to talk, reason, and live with each other, that we'll do an awful lot better job. Well, I think uh, we should leave it right there because that's uh, those are lovely words to kind of uh, end this conversation. And uh, it is so good to reconnect to you. Uh, if you're ever out here, you hey. please let me know. If I'm, are, are you in uh, Are you in uh, Little Rock right now? Are you still there? Yeah, I live in Little Rock, yes. All right. All right. If I'm around there, I assure you, I'm going to be knocking on your door. I'm going to have Felicia, ah, well, Felicia, right? Your, your knees, oh, I'm going to have her <laughs> come get me. You, you think Remember when you called, I noticed, and I watched you on TV, and I've, and you know you've been doing really good work. And I've been keeping up with some of the wonderful things you do, and I'm really going to look, go out and find you and your daughter's book so I can read it to, for nothing more to know what it says, to know what what's well. It's, what, it's what we we'll send you one. We'll send you one. Yeah, it's coming oh, your way. Don't one. don't don't you worry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll get you okay. one. And, right. and uh, Susan, you're on that, yes. 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 Okay. Then we also have an audio book. If anybody wants. Oh, to you do. Are your eyes good? Still, you able to read? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, in fact, I had okay. I I surgery two weeks ago. That's why I can't see quite oh, wow. as well tonight. But but I'm doing. Oh, I'm. I can. I have no trouble reading. No trouble. Great. You know, with right. driving. I do, I do. My eyes see everything I want to see. I, I guess my husband says I. I, that my problem is is when I don't see something. He just he said, "Well, you just decided you didn't want to see that." But no, my vision. <laughs> I don't, I don't I even think, wear glasses. I think he's he, he's preparing to 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 talk to to adjust to if your hearing ever starts to go down. He's going to assume that that's you just don't want to hear him. Well, uh, oh, is that? I be, I think he already <laughs> thinks that. <laughs> well, listen, uh, Caleb, you. we're going to let. The, Real. You betcha. Thank you so much. And thank you for everything you've always done and for being such a joy. And we'll, we'll stay in touch. Okay. 
Well, well, thank you very much. Good you night. Bet. And Caleb will let Dr. Elders go. There we are. We're back. Um, thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, the restream, I am beg your pardon, on uh, Clubhouse. We're going to wrap up that room. Thank you for uh, spending time with us here on Clubhouse. We're going to end that room. Great um, questions. Good questions. Also, we have a sale of a blue mic on uh, Twitch. And you just go to drdrew.com slash blue, and you should get a discount at the end. Explain. I don't think more. you need a that, discount code. That was I not think, a clear pitch. If so you just go to drdrew.com slash blue. Yeah. You just click through and you should the discount should come out at checkout. So so people will get discounts on any blue mic. Is that I correct? I think so, yeah. Any blue uh, earphones and stuff too, everything? I, I, I think so. I don't know. Caleb, do you know? Well, Caleb, it's I'm, I'm not sure if, if there's terrible. a discount code or not. I just know they go to drdrew.com slash blue. And, okay. the, and again, all blue products. Is that correct? We don't. I'm, was there I'm actually on. not. Sh I'm it. not sure if they have a discount set up for it or not. I just know if they go okay. there, then they can because get all the their information. products. If it's all, if it's if it's all blue products, I recommend you go there fast because they, <laughs> yeah, have, yeah. they have these headphones that are amazing. They have mics that are amazing. They have amazing, amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, it's good stuff. But I, I, I can't promise there you. There may not find... be a discount. Oh, now no discount. I don't know. Uh, oh my gosh. I don't think this so. is the best. Best. I'm uh, not sure. I can't remember. It's been so long. I'll, I'll have to. Check back with us on Friday and well, tell us how it goes. So Email thank you. me. Yeah, let us know. At, and we'll at, try to correct. We'll try no, to get some contact. Let's, let's try account. to get some discounts going if indeed that's what people want. So um yeah. thank you. Uh <laughs> Russell is Russell and uh Van have become our, our comedic uh, uh sort of uh, I miss Tom's cigars today. I know where is Tom's? He's so working. you've all been you're all making very nice comments about Joyson. We appreciate that very much. Let me just quickly um, go back to Dr. Fauci. That seemed to be the, a lot of what was going on in the restream. Um, I'm not defending anything. I'm just saying, I think based on my previous everything. experience with him, he will look better when you're looking back. That's all I'm saying. And if the politicizing had never happened and we were able to just have listened to him, he would have been a pretty good guy. When he said, don't wear masks, we all, meaning my profession, thought that this virus, you remember washing everything off and washing your hands? That's because we thought it was on your hands. And masks make hand-derived infections worse because we're messing with our masks. We put it up to our face. And if we had had, if it were hand-derived, masks would have been a bad idea. And we needed masks for the hospital and first responders. So there was two reasons for saying, eh, don't use masks. I, that was the correct opinion at the time that ended up being wrong as we learned about the virus more and its transmission through the air. So that's why that happened to claim somebody lied because they if 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 every time we got something wrong biologically every scientist every clinician on earth would be massive liars. We get stuff wrong all the time. We yeah, use Bayesian reasoning. We update our priors. It's called updating your priors. We adjust, we look at the data and we adjust and move forward. We can still be wrong. Happens a lot. We do the best we can with an infinitely complex system called human biology. We do the best we can. So there we go. There's, 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 back there, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They're asking for it. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and uh, and vaccine, uh, I, I don't quite understand what all the vaccine stuff was about today. Uh, again, I, I, I share well, people's concerns. I share concerns. I'm concerned, even though I'm an advocate and a it fan. Was, it was I'm a concerned. good, people were listening. They were, and, they and were, do know, do know that when this, these antivirals come, it's going to trust, trust me on this. This will, it's going to take a little bit to get it sort of figure out where to use it all and how it's going to work, but it's going to change everything. That's when we are going to be much, much better off. Um, I love when she said ignorance is not bliss. <laughs> I know, that's cute. That's going to be my new saying. Ignorance is not bliss. <laughs> so uh, again, we thank you all for being here. Uh, Fauci said you could catch AIDS oh, from a cereal joking. box. That, that I'd love to see, Bobby. He's joking. Uh, Project Veritas video. Somebody's saying there's a Project Veritas video. Yeah, that, there's another one. And that is on what I kind of was hearing that. Is that on masking or is that on vaccine, um, vaccines? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah. So I listen, as I said, Joe it, wasn't it, here today. When it comes to biology, you can't be, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not adamant so much as, uh, you know, 100% confident in your position. You always have to be ready to update your priors. We call that in medicine. And uh, that's funny, Chris. Um, Diana, what'd you say? The musical is wild. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so it is just the case that you have to be constantly adjusting and updating your priors. And when when people come out with mandates for anything other than listen to your doctor and you two make a decision together, 
mandates worry me. They worry me a lot. Yeah. And I, I'm worried that mandates are going to end up doing more, not more harm than good, but that enough harm to be uncomfortable. I understand why they feel the need to do it. We have an issue with this virus replicating. If it replicates too much, we will get a horrible variant that will be a freaking mess. We don't want that. Now, with the antivirals, yeah. that might be a little less of a risk. So things are getting better. So uh, just pay attention. Ha it's fine to have firm opinions. I don't mind defensible opinions, but don't assume. If, you, if you're if you 100% convinced of something, just be very, very cautious with that. Uh, okay, get it on. As Everybody saying. doesn't like when you said Dr. Drew said that Fauci was going to end up looking good when this is all over. People don't like I said that. Uh, I mean, he, time will go by and and it'll be, you know. I, and I and listen, I may be wrong. I know. He, I may be wrong. There he might may, be he more may than look worse. He may look worse when but it's all over. But we don't want to like But I and I'm I'm totally too open to that. And by the way, at the point that if he really starts to look bad, I I will adjust my priors. Trust me on that. But I'm just I'm betting on my experience across four decades with this man. And okay, so that's what I'm betting. Project on. Veritas video Pfizer scientists saying that natural immunity was better than their vaccine. Well, that's true. That's true. It is true. That is true. And so, but but you could end up you really sick and die. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't mean you shouldn't take a vaccine. That's just true. Uh, okay, let's wrap this thing up. We are not going to be here tomorrow. We will be here on Saturday, or roughly. No, I mean Friday, Friday. Friday. Beg your pardon. Twelve p.m. Twelve p.m. And we may do like a local Zoom party, and I'll bring in a guest, and we'll uh, we'll see your beautiful faces again so if you want to be in the zoom party you have to sign up at locals dot or dr drew dot wait locals.com slash dr drew become a member and then the it's, zoom meeting will be posted there what's it's that dr drew dot locals dot com that's what I okay thought. dr drew locals dot com all right i'm it's been a while um and we'll see you guys well hang on a second bobby i've been telling he's giving me a little history about dr fauci and cereal boxes well, uh, interesting. He might have been worried about that. And then he updated his priors once we learned so about the causative kidding. agent. No, that's interesting to me. We thought all, we had a lot of crazy How ideas. How could you get AIDS we had in a, a lot cereal of, box? We had a lot of crazy ideas about HIV and AIDS when we were calling it GRIDS. We were calling it gay-related intestinal disease syndrome. We had no idea what caused well, it. We, we had no idea it how it was spread. Seat. We didn't know anything about it. And we're coming up with constant ideas about what might be something we needed to, to pay attention to. Makes sense to me that fomites uh, re related to food would have been something they've been looking at because it was really first diagnosed as a diarrhea. It was first, a, it was called gay-related intestinal disease syndrome. Yeah. So, Lovely. So there you Thanks go. Thanks for sharing. So uh, interesting history and a great point in point, case in point. He updated his priors. He figured out what was going on. He was instrumental in us turning AIDS from a death sentence to a chronic illness, which was Dr. Elders pointed out to us at the beginning. Now, yes, and uh, cat, oh, wait, <laughs> cat poop won't poop? <laughs> Can't poop won't poop. Can't poop won't poop <laughs> says scientific process is messy for sure. Let's leave it on that. That is, in fact, the case, especially in clinical sciences. We'll see you on Friday at noon. Thank you all and for being here. Thank ignorant you. is not bliss. Thank you to Joyce and Elders for being here. Thank you to Kayla for producing this. And we'll see you soon. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources.